Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Hamry. I welcome you to uh, CSIS, uh, part of our military strategy forum. We're a little unusual today. We normally just are able to get one big guy, and we ended up with three. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the country is perilously on the edge of insecurity right now because they're here. Uh, but we're really delighted that they take the time to be with us. And of course, the purpose is to dig a little deeper into this new national uh, security space strategy, which has just been released. It's, a, it's an important document. It's a part of a series of strategy documents that the administration has been releasing. This, of course, is, I think, the latest, most uh, interesting in some sense. It uh, involves a historic problem we've had in, uh, from I remember my time, where, you know, how do we organize ourselves for space? And is it really, uh, is it really an AOR? You know, or is it, uh, uh, is it simply an ancillary uh, adjunct to you know, other activities that are really defense activities? So it's a complex, interesting, interesting question. And of course, it, it has with it the complexity of being both a, a government activity and a private sector activity and a national security activity and a commercial activity. So it's, got, it's a really a complicated problem, and we're going to dig into this a little bit today. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'm delighted that you're here. Let me, let me begin. Uh, by the way, if, if, if Secretary Lin says anything that's a little goofy, it's because he just flew in at 1 o'clock in the morning. And he, so he's still on California time, so don't blame him. Uh, but Secretary, let me start with you and ask you, um, okay, you've got a new strategy. Uh, what's different about this than the one that you inherited from the Bush administration? <coughs> Well, well, thanks, John, and thanks uh, again for hosting this and uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here with, with General Cartwright and Secretary Donnelly. And uh, here mostly uh, because we, I flipped a coin with uh, Secretary Gates uh, earlier in the week, and uh, I won and I'm here, and he lost. He's testifying this morning before the House Armed Services right. Committee. Uh, I think we all won too, didn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but. Um, I mean, the, the first thing that's different uh, from this strategy, John, is this is actually the first space strategy. There, they, we have not uh, dedicated a strategy document before this point uh, to uh, our space strategy. I think it represents the importance that this domain has uh, for our, our military capabilities, our industrial capabilities, and our economic well-being. You asked what's different, and, and I think what's different is that Space is far more congested than it was just uh, 20 years ago. It's, it's no longer the private preserve of, of the U.S. and then uh, Soviet Union. There's, there's more than 60 nations now that have a presence in space. It's also more congested in the sense that there's much, much more debris. And it's a, a, it would, debris itself has become a, a real danger. Uh, if you, there's a table in the space strategy that, that points out that it took uh, something like 40 years to get the first 10,000 objects in space, and it's taken us about six years to get the next 10,000 objects. So we're, we're really, the, 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 the growth of debris in space is a, is a threat in and of itself. Space is also more competitive uh, than it was. The, uh, the dangers to our space assets now are far more than just uh, direct ascent ASAT weapons, uh, jamming, uh, lasers, cyber threats all pose a threat to, uh, to, spa to, uh, to space. And then finally, it's a far more competitive uh, environment. It, 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 20, 25 years ago, the U.S. had two-thirds of the space market. Now, we're still the leader in space, but it's our, our share of the market is now 35 or 40 percent. So we, we thought we needed a, a strategy to deal with these, these changed circumstances. And the strategy is, is intended not only to protect our capabilities in space, but we need a strategy to protect space itself. And we need a strategy to protect the space industrial base. And that's what this, uh, this strategy is intended to do. Um. Secretary, let me, let me follow up. You can usually judge, you know, the importance of a document by how quickly, you know, the opposition documents appear in the, in the press. And that, you have light speed. Uh, recently, there was a letter that was authored by, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 members of the Senate voicing concern about 
uh, one dimension, which I'm not sure is even in your strategy, which talks about this European Union code of conduct. I couldn't find it uh, actually in the strategy, and yet it's implying that this is part of it. Can you t help, uh, help me understand what this, what this little controversy sure. is about? Well, sure. I mean, the EU code of conduct is not mentioned in the strategy. That that's right, and it's a it's a code of conduct that the the Europeans are are developing. Uh, I think they hope to have it final in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. It promotes uh, freedom of access and exploration and use of space. Uh, it's focused on timely notification and consultation for space activities. Now, the, as I said, this is not in our space strategy, but frankly, it's very consistent with some of the goals of the space strategy the, to promote responsible use of space and tr transparency of activities in space. So we, we are uh, looking uh, with great interest at this code of conduct and working uh, with the Europeans. And it has some important uh, uh, protections. In particular, it recognizes the right of self-defense. So it's not uh, restrictive in that way, but we think it promotes transparency and, and uh, responsible use of space. So we, uh, we think it's a positive, it, it has a very mm -hmm. strong potential of being a, a positive step. I think that's one of the concerns of the authors, is that it would constrain our uh, missile defense capabilities. So and, well, I, th I think there are proposals out there uh, in more in the traditional arms control realm that might well have that, that impact. And we, we, for that reason, we would share that reluctance, uh, opposition, frankly, to, to mm -hmm. going down mm -hmm. that road. Mm -hmm. But we think that this kind of voluntary uh, uh, code of conduct where uh, it promotes responsible behavior, trying to uh, talk about the proliferation of debris in space, mm -hmm. this would be uh, a, a, an answer or a partial answer to that kind of threat. Uh, and we, so we think it's, a, let, it's a, we view it very positively. Let, let me come back on that, on this question of responsible behavior. That becomes a very interesting issue. Uh, Secretary Donnelly, let me ask you, you're the, you're the daddy rabbit for, for space now. Uh, that's not the technical term. Uh, to, uh, executive think, uh, agent. Executive is the agent. Like to say, right? yeah. It's amazing how you forget when you leave government, <laughs> you know. Um, but as the uh, daddy rabbit, uh, you know, one of the things that I've always wondered, uh, you know, we've, if we're going to have a space policy, you've got to have a pretty good idea what's in space. And yet we always seem to struggle with the tools for uh, space reconnaissance. What's, what's the status? of our capacity for good situational awareness in space? Well, I think this is a, a, a new part, uh, or certainly a growing part, of the job jar for the space domain. Um, as the Secretary uh, alluded to, just the increase in, uh, in the debris in space and the number of objects that need to be tracked for, for basically safe and secure operations uh, is reason enough for us to be more interested in what's happening in the space domain. We've used for, for decades, we've used uh, the space domain for important missions, uh, miss, missile warning, communications, uh, ISR, weather, uh, all, all kinds of, of purposes. But uh, I think it's only recently that we've uh, come to appreciate the importance mm -hmm of surveilling space itself and understanding what is going on in this domain. We've had capabilities in place uh, for a number of years to do that, uh, but they need to be modernized and we need, to, uh, we need to improve our capacity to understand what's going on in the space uh, domain in, in many different dimensions. So we've had, we've had optical tracking capabilities. Uh, we have had a space fence across the uh, the southern part of the United States to help uh, uh, capture uh, space objects traveling uh, overhead. Just this last year we, we uh, launched the first uh, space-based surveillance system that will help us uh, do some of that work from, from space and, and we need to modernize and continue to expand capacity in this area. I, I, but I'll say, I, a lot of that is, is as old as I am. It's been kept up better than I have, but uh, uh, it is, it's as old as I am. I mean, this stuff really needs investment, doesn't it? It does, and, and I think, again, this is a growing part of, uh, of the mission set mm -hmm. uh, associated mm -hmm. with space. Mm -hmm. um, General Cartwright, uh, uh, you know, Secretary Lynn talked about this is more of a contested uh, regime. 
And let me ask you uh, very much this question. I've, I'm familiar with some of the wargaming that's been done on space, and I'll use my terms, not anybody else's, but it, you know, it kind of looks like whoever gets off the first shot wins. So what do we do? I mean, is this a hardening strategy? Is this a deterrence strategy? Is it a dissuasion strategy? What, what do we do because of this unique asymmetric vulnerability of space assets? Well, I mean, I guess the first thing, John, that uh, comes to mind is one, if there's going to be a contested activity in space, it doesn't mean that you have to respond in space, number one. Number two, all of space is not in space. There's a large amount of it that is part of the terrestrial systems. And so those are vulnerable areas, but they're also our strengths and can be. Um, I think key, kind of going back and playing off the first two answers, is you have to know what's going on in space in order to have an idea of what's happened to you and whether it's appropriate to respond in, in a way that would be um, self-defense or whether it's more appropriate to do other things. And the norms in space are what, what we're trying to get to. Um, we have a good idea of what's out there, as long as you can give us days to determine it. Conflict, resolution of commercial issues, resolution of uh, economic issues in space needs to happen faster than that. Every time there is a conjunction, when two bodies are predicted to come too close together that one of them probably ought to get out of the way, that's an investment. Somebody who has a spacecraft up there has to invest and, and expend fuel and life in economic terms. And so we get into a game of chicken because we don't have a set of rules about passing left to left or whatever it is we're going to do out there, number one. And number two, our, our instruments are not precise enough that, that we know exactly when we need to move and when we don't need to move. So having a better set of norms so that, so that space vehicles go in certain places, have certain footprints, have certain um, areas of protection around them, sovereignty if you want to call that, having that be a norm, uh, understanding who's responsible for moving and who's not responsible for moving if it's just a collision, but having a way that, that you norm the behavior in space so when an anomaly appears, it is an anomaly and it's detectable. And having a system that can see it in a timely fashion so that we know what's going on and who's there raises the bar in deterrence raises the bar in behavior in space in a way that's beneficial to all that participate. Mm -hmm. So that space situation awareness layer is in, unto itself an element of the dissuasion of the deterrent strategy that we would put in place. That's critical. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's the first step to understand out there. Absent that, you're really in a very large area of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And so much of the priorities that we're putting in uh, to our investment portfolios and into the policy have to do with space situation awareness. Understanding what's going on out there in a time that's actually relevant to the activities. I, I, I may be asking a question that you can't answer uh, here, but uh, how, how do we norm activities for assets that countries don't want to acknowledge exist? Um, we're, we've kind of gotten to this, this cultural approach that because I'm in space, nobody knows. And generally what happens is, only the people, you know, in your own country don't know. Everybody else does. <laughs> you know? And so, so at some point, you have to, to say, okay, enough is enough. Because of the explosion, mm -hmm. because of, of how many vehicles are out there, because of the mm -hmm. debris, mm -hmm. I mean, you still have to provide all of the services to something that somebody wants to pretend is not there. Okay? And so at some point, we have to really, just like we did in the air, just like we did in the ocean, you have to acknowledge and put traffic control mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and know what's out there and know what can get in the way. Mm -hmm. Is there a concept of, of, of sovereign uh, dimensionality around assets? Has, has that been thought through? I mean, I, it's first I've heard of it. It's very interesting. It's, it is a thought process. It is what we need to start to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. unlike many of the other AORs, you don't have a, a piece of land on which you say that's the border between X and Y. Mm -hmm. um, so what is reasonable? And, and we usually think about it in two dimensions. One is the physical properties and how close two, two objects come to get together. The other is the spectral side of this equation. Because much of what's in space is emitting or receiving. And, and we probably have more challenges with stepping on each other's 
signals, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and making sure that they're deconflicted. So you have to think about it in both ways. And that comes down to Earth, to landing rights, where can they emit to on, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, all of those are considerations that you have to put in place as you talk about the norms in space. I will say, I think the, I think the department's done a very good job of protecting spectrum in space assets through the years. Now that may be it's more of a contended space now. When you look at the geo belt and you look at, at vehicles stacked three and four deep in the same yeah. slot, yeah. I mean, it becomes a huge issue. It is a big issue. Yeah. It really is. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary Lynn, let me, you, you brought up the question when you talked about uh, the industrial base and the challenges with the industrial base. Let me ask, what, for how, would you, how would you evaluate the space relevant industrial base today? the United States? Well, as I said, I think it's, it's, we have the leading share, but it is no longer the, the, the majority uh, share. And so I think we do need to take steps to ensure the vitality of our space industrial base. And indeed, in this, this budget, led uh, largely by the Air Force Secretary Donnelly, we've tried to take some concrete steps, uh, one, to preserve access to space by having a much more stable buy of the EELV. Frankly, the commercial market for EELV has not come in in the way we had hoped, and we need to ensure that that program is a, is a solid uh, in the industrial world as in order to preserve that, that access. At the same time in this, this budget, we, we found, we think we need a, uh, to modify our approach to ac acquisition of space assets. And we've, proposed at least uh, with a couple of programs, the AHF uh, communications satellite and then next year uh, the SIBR satellite to try and uh, use a block buy, fixed price contract, stable R&D, sustaining engineering line, a combination of those things to get far more predictability, far more stability in our buys in space and far more uh, timed infusions of technology. So it's not, we don't we tend to buy space assets as, as one off and then a few years later we buy, we invent a new one and buy another one. And so ev everything is a unique, uh, unique asset going into space. We don't use regular industrial processes. Now there's some unique aspects to space that you can't get away from, but we think for example with block buys we can get far more learning uh, on satellites as we build them and then do block upgrades and then do another block buy. And so we're, this is uh, a, an initiative uh, it's, uh, we have with Congress this year and we're hoping that will lead to more stability for the industrial base. Those are a couple of concrete steps but it reflects our belief that, that it, we do need to take steps to preserve our leadership in, in uh, space industry. Can I, can I press on two, two kind of dimensions here? One on, on uh, international cooperation. You know, we've had kind of an attitude that we're going to restrict our space satellite manufacturers so that they can't do anything internationally unless they can prove somebody else can already do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but, uh, but we've, we've kind of done that. What's, what is your thinking now about how to manage technology, sensitive technology in the space domain, given that so many other people are in, are capable of launching satellites now? Well, I think that's, uh, your premise is exactly right, but it extends far more than space. I, I think we have an export control regime that was frankly built during the Cold War with the intent of a, you know, a peer to peer competition and basically keeping all of our stuff out of their hands. Uh, the Cold War is long dead, but that export control regime uh, still, still thrives today, but now seems to be designed to keep uh, technologies uh, from our closest allies, uh, even as we're fighting side by side. So we're, uh, we have a broader effort inside the administration to reform that export control process to try, in Secretary Gates' wor words, to put higher walls around many fewer items. The, those, those crown jewel technology items protect those, frankly, more strongly but to allow much more international uh, export of the, the things, as you say, that everyone else has anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, international partnering, it seems, because it's, you know, if, if, they're going to, if this is going to become a global industry, and it is becoming a global industry, it seems to me we want an American company in the lead everywhere, but that means you've got to let them partner, and we've got to let them get out and, and be in the lead. And no, I, I think, think that's, that's exactly right. Let me ask about the booster side. This is, of course, a a little more difficult problem. Fifteen years ago, when we had visions of, you know, 
two and three launches a day, you know, uh, we thought we would have a large, robust commercial sector that we could ride on as a government. Right. And of course, that fell apart. At the same time, Congress enacted a restriction preventing us from working with the Chinese, thinking that then they'll never develop an ICBM if they're not allowed to work with us. Of course, that didn't work. And it led to them developing the most reliable space booster in the world right now. So we've got the worst of all worlds. Uh, we've got an industry that was built on commercial demand, which doesn't exist. We've got a government that doesn't buy enough from it. And we've got restrictions that don't let them cooperate. Something's got to change here. What, what are you thinking about? What do we change? Well, that's part of what I was alluding to, the EELV. I think we, we, we did build the EELV program was premised in the 90s on the idea that there would be a robust commercial market and we would just be, uh, frankly, a minority buyer yeah. uh, in that. But we're now clearly the majority, if not the, uh, the only buyer. And so we have adjusted our, uh, our, uh, our, our procurement pattern to reflect that. It's, it's not the world we wanted, but it's the world we have. And so we've tried to do this now in a way that we think will protect that capability in order so that we have guaranteed access to space. Well, we've made a couple of adjustments programmatically in terms of how we're approaching the launch work. Um, over the past several years, our approach has been to align the launcher with the, with the payload. And so if and as the payload and programs get adjusted, then the launchers fall in and out of, of our procurement plans. And this has produced, uh, and just as the Secretary alluded to sort of inefficiencies in the, in the, in the satellite or program area, it, it applies also in the booster area and to EELV. So we made a decision this past summer to decouple uh, the launchers and the payloads so that we could buy the launchers uh, on a more routine basis and wait longer to make decisions about uh, which payloads get married to which launchers. But to, uh, to stabilize the industrial base, we'll now have a steady flow of EELVs across the future year defense program. And we did that work in coordination with NASA and, and NRO as well to establish what was identified to us as the minimum required to sustain that base mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. effectively. And now, now we have to go in and negotiate <coughs> Uh, the best prices that we can get from that. That's still work to be done uh, with ULA. Uh, but I think we've, we've put in place a much more uh, stable uh, approach for buying boosters. And, and we're doing it in, in with interagency coordination here so that we get uh, more of a U.S. government uh, approach to this than having three separate departments, agencies speaking to one provider. And what, what will we do to help our booster industry be globally competitive? Is there something that we're thinking we can do there as well? Well, I think the export well, control issues really are, mm -hmm. are, are, are key here and sort of work, working through those. And guaranteeing, you know, if we guarantee a production base, obviously they get to price more on the margin, and that, that would be helpful as well mm -hmm. for them. And that. I think there's, be, there, there's another there, piece to this that, that um, I think it's worth, uh, in the debate, going into the policies. Um, you know, there was an element here of, of even if we got the best acquisition system in the world and got everything smoothed out so that we could get the price to the best we could do, we still can't afford most of the constellations we have up there. So at some point, you have to come to a position of partnering. Hmm. And does that mean that you partner in kind? Or does that mean that you partner by other nations putting up assets and then you network them together? Um, we right now still want to believe we're going to go it alone. It's not affordable. We can't do it for all of the things that we expect as a nation to get from space. We need to start partnering. We need to build, build constructs to partner. That, that's kind of piece one. Piece two is for our national industries. We've got to put them on a base where the transaction rate is not build me two and I'll come back in 10 years and then I want you to build the next two. It just doesn't work. I mean, you can't build a labor force against that. And so how are we going to change those constructs in order to be able to work in space? Um, we don't have to be the only people that have sensing in space. We aren't. There is good sensing out there in other places. If, 
if we have a four ball constellation and the guy next door has a four ball constellation, if you just do it in revisit rates, you cut it in half, it's very important to the warfighter, very valuable, and all you do is combine the data, pull the data together. Um, you know, we have this construct where we believe it's got to come from us. And, and the problem is we don't fight as a single nation anymore. We fight and combine constructs. And so if I'm expecting the guy in the foxhole next to me to, do, to fight and sacrifice, and I say to him, you watch my flank, but I can't tell you what's coming over there because it's a secret. Nobody knows I'm in space. It's just crazy. It, you, can't, you can't do that. If, so if we're going to operate and if we're going to fight in, in a combined way, we've got to build our constellations, whether they be sea, air, or space, in a combined way. It just, there are certain things that we will want to keep competitive advantage on. But the others, have got, we've got to find a way to get to scale. We've got to find a way to preserve the intellectual capital mm -hmm. in the industrial base, and we can't do it on these cycles that we're doing it today. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it is. I don't have any strong feelings about it. You know, I'm glad for that. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad you left your gun in the agreement. Um, uh, I, in that regard, we're going to have to tackle the way we deal with security clearances for foreigners in our, in our installations. I mean, you know, we, we want them in, we consider them federated partners, but then we say they can't look at the memo they just wrote because it right. went into CIPRNET. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we've got to, we'll have to find a solution. Um, Mike, you, you're, you are going to be the, the executive agent. Uh, about 90% of the people in this room are here to figure out how you're going to do that because they're going to report back to bosses or clients that they now understand. So. Why don't you tell us, what are you going to do with this uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all of these people have to fill out a report to justify coming. And, and my boss wants to know too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, the space policy and strategy work has gotten a lot of close attention over the last couple of years. As we saw that building up, it was, it was obviously the case that we needed to step up our game in space in the department. Uh, and under uh, Secretary Lin's leadership, we stepped through several discussions at uh, his defense or deputies advisory working group, the dog level discussion, to sort out the way forward on how we do space governance in the Department of Defense. So we, we've had those debates and, and the result of that was the establishment of the Defense Space Council, uh, which, which will be chaired by the executive agent. We've had a couple of meetings to get, to get going already. The purpose of this really is to coordinate and integrate the department's space work across the board. Not to micromanage the programs, but to coordinate some of the international, some of the industrial work that crisscrosses these programs and the architectures and assumptions that we have going forward about how we're going to do MILSATCOM and how we're going to do missile warning and how we're going to do other aspects of our, of our work, weather for example. So there are there are international, industrial, interagency partnerships to be had in all that. And the purpose of the Defense Space Council is to keep all that coordinated and integrated uh, in the department. And to the extent issues need to come up to the secretary's level uh, for decision, it's our job to work those issues up through the Defense Space Council. So between the, uh, the president's space policy and the national security, uh, sp space nat national security space strategy just released, there are 30 some action items out there for departments and agencies. Not all of them are DOD, but, but we have either leadership or equity in many of them. And our task is to work through those to-do lists, working on industrial base issues, working on architectures, uh, working on uh, partnerships and how to put those together. The, the secretary, uh, the, the uh, vice chairman is a spot on in terms of the, the overall emphasis in this strategy is recognizing reality that we are not alone, mm -hmm. that we can't do everything on our, uh, our own and that we need to have more partnerships not just across the industrial sectors and, and commercial sectors. It's not just the people that that carry our payloads or build our payloads, but who are doing commercial work uh, from which we can benefit uh, and looking into the possibilities for more hosted payloads and, and such and partnering. Uh, Secretary Gates just signed a space situational awareness partnership with the government of Australia. So 
Um, so I, I think the, the purpose of the Defense Space Board in general was to, was to tr recognize the, the volume of work in the Department of Defense and in the inter interagency that would be coming uh, from this new emphasis and to prepare ourselves to organize to, to meet those tasks. And do I understand then that uh, the Defense Space Council, Defense Space Board, is the focal point for all interagency things as well? So for example, NOAA interface or NASA interface or FAA interface, is it all, is it through you? We, we still have to work out some of those relationships because, uh, for example, the, the um, the ENPOS, or the, the Weather uh, Satellite Consortium that's been out there, has been an interagency governance uh, process in and of itself. GPS has had some of the same uh, interagency uh, governing processes that we do not own as a Department of Defense. So we'll have to kind of work through those going forward. But um, in the near term, our focus will be really to partner with the DNI and the intelligence community. This National Security Space Strategy is a joint product of DOD and the DNI. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the DOD has gotten the Defense Space Board up and operating, uh, General Clapper on the DNI side is sort of working through governance in his community. Uh, and we expect in the next couple of months for that to be resolved in a way that we can then identify the two. We've got the DOD and the DNI piece identified and we can figure out uh, how we will go forward let me, together. Let me just personally lobby you on one thing, that you, know, the, you are also the executive agent for the National Airspace Plan for the de Defense Department, uh, mm -hmm. you know, airplanes flying through the air. And of course, the new navigation system is going to be a space-based navigation system. So this uniquely ought to be brought together in that space. You and NASA should, and, uh, and FAA should be working this. We, we are certainly working the FAA piece of that in, in intensively. Uh, General Carrot, let me, you, you already touched on this, uh, the warfighting issues associated with space. And what's emerged in the last couple of years has been this kind of notion of a global commons. And uh, I'd like to drill in a little bit on this. Um, you know, the, the idea that, that all of humanity shares some things in common and that we benefit from it being available to everybody, that's, that's clear. But what happens when you got a rogue actor that's in the global commons? Uh, how do we deal with that? I mean, uh, how do you identify? How do you stigmatize? How do you, you know, how do you bring uh, global condemnation for behavior? How do we know it? How do we verify? Uh, what, how are you thinking about this? Well, um, you know, the, the concept of commons really um, was heavily debated in, in the development of the strategies because there are legal implications to using the term mm. that have, have developed over the years. But, but suffice it to say, the attributes of an area in which multiple nations expect to do commerce, expect to do military activities, et cetera, is is in some terms a commons area. And, and the thought process right now is we have put structure to the commons that we call the sea. We have put structure to the commons we call air. That structure gives, gives us uh, confidence that we can do commerce, that we can do um, military activities in a way that sets a pattern of, and an expectation of behavior. And the question is, should we be doing the same in space? And the numbers clearly drive you in that direction. Even if, if a large part of it is debris, just the management of traffic and, and avoidance of, of collisions, which take away the or increase the cost of commerce, the, the price of doing business, drives you to some sort of pattern. It's true on the national security side also. To the extent that you can have a standard behavior such that an anomaly can be detected when somebody's not behaving in a standard way helps you identify who is causing the problem. It may be willful. It may be a malfunction. You, you really don't know until you can assess it. So again, I take you back to space situation awareness. It's got to get down to a level of fidelity that things like attribution, things that are not necessarily willful, can be detected for what they are, mm. acted on in a timely mm. fashion, because every minute that somebody's not broadcasting a satellite uh, 
image for, for television or whatever is revenue to somebody. And it, and it changes the cost factors out there. That's the same on the national security side. Every minute that somebody's doing something out there that they shouldn't is a problem. The sooner that you're going to be detected, the more difficult it is to hide your actions. And so there is an element of deterrence in this structure that has to be a part of what we do. What we have today, again, is not as robust as we want. We are putting new systems in, new processors. Right, right, right. But quite frankly, this is back to partnering. We couldn't afford to put all the terrestrial sensors up there that we need to do this in minutes and seconds rather than in days and weeks. And so we've got to rely on partners. One of the concepts we're discussing with partners is, would you like to be part of the Combined Space Operations Center? If so, bring your sensors. Because we've got to find a way to get a global awareness. And there is a terrestrial element to that. You've got to be on the land or in, in an area, things like transfer orbits to geospa uh, geosynchronous. You have to be in the right places to detect these activities. We don't necessarily own those places, and they're not necessarily in the commons. And so we have to have partners to start doing this. But the more that anomalous behavior can be detected, the more the cost of operating a space goes down, and the more the security issues are better managed. Let me just mention, you know, the NOAA has pioneered with the GEO system a very good international <coughs> model of collaboration on technical sensors. Mm -hmm. And it's a potentially something you might want to look at in this yeah. space. But let me again come in, if I, if I could. Um, obviously, we have to have the technical capacity. But, you know, when a, when a drunken Chinese fisher trawler captain rams into a Japanese patrol craft, we can take a picture of that and put it on, on YouTube and CNN. I mean, you know, but what do we do in space? I mean, this is a, you know, it's, this is, gets to be a lot harder to create that sort of deterrence environment when, frankly, the capacity to monitor real term is hard, really hard. It's hard, but it's no harder than trying to take the same picture in the middle of the ocean when two tankers run into each other. I mean, there's not a camera post sitting out there. The intent here, though, is to be able to track this stuff just like we do other things, track in the large area, look for patterns that, that deviate, focus in with sensors that need to if you, if you think there's going to be a conjunction in space. So that you can see we have the optical sensors, we have the space-based optical sensors. We have a system that can do it. The question is can we bring it to scale and get it to report in a coherent way so that we can actually act inside of the decision loops rather than, oh yeah, those two did run into each other. I'm, I'm kind of running the tape back now to take a look at it. That's the mode that we're in today. Okay. We've got to get that changed. Yep. Uh, colleagues, we're, we're going to take questions uh, from the floor. We've got two microphones, and so I'd ask you to kind of work your way up. I'm going to ask one last question, and the people that want to ask questions, start queuing up, and we'll try to get as many in as we can here. Uh, and, uh, General, let me one last one for you, and that is uh, the other domain that's frequently referred to as in commons now is cyberspace. How do you think about space and cyberspace as related activity is are we, are we integrating them are they integratable should they be are they you know because cyberspace is has terrestrial attributes it's of course so does space uh, so how, how would you think about this um, people people have often talked about putting the two together we thought about commands that would be basically mm -hmm. the same command having the those responsibilities and some of the services that's the case um, but you know, essentially, you're dealing in two areas that have a very different relationship to geography. I mean, in comparison to the water, in comparison to the air, et cetera. So, so the speeds, the, the, the lack of reference to the ground, et cetera, uh, those are similar. But, but the reality here is that, uh, at least from my perspective on the warfighting side, really pretty much agnostic to the medium in which you operate. Mm. So if you're in the operations in space and you need to work at speeds that, are talk that we're talking about there in orbital speeds, speed of light is a nice, nice way to operate. Uh, it tends to catch things in a hurry. And, and so if you're going to move cyber through space, either in a defensive way, in a just general path of communications way, moving at those speeds, are there's a synergy with space that, that's there and you don't have a lot of buildings in between. To, to get in the path. So that's, that's the nice part about this. The other part that, that comes, particularly for the Department of Defense or National Security, is that if you're trying to get from country X, the United States, to country Y, and there's several countries in between, 
you really are not pa passing through their airspace. You don't necessarily have to pass through their land, mm -hmm. et cetera. You can move over and move down. We're a global force. We need the space capabilities to operate in that global force. Cyber, whether it be just the, the use of, of information and the movement of information, or whether it be in a defensive nature to protect that information, tends to want to operate in the same. In other words, we can't operate globally without that information, and we've got to protect that information as it moves. Space gives us a venue to do that in a way that we can't necessarily do in other venues. Good. Thank you. Okay, let me open up here. Bruce, you're the brave one. Can I have, right, just come on up here, folks. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Bruce McDonald with the uh, United States Institute of Peace and author of the Council on Foreign Relations Study on China's Space Weapons and U.S. Security. Uh, I was very pleased, first let me uh, thank the gentleman for being here and, and sharing your views with us. Uh, I was very pleased to see in the space strategy as well as in the space policy uh, uh, references to um, uh, deterrence and stability and all those good kinds of things. Uh, if you look in the nuclear area, uh, there's a lot of information out there about what our nuclear forces are, what our policies are, doctrines, you know, the uh, nuclear posture review is uh, full of that. Uh, but if you look in the space area, you'd see very, you'd see references to space deterrence, but uh, I'm sure maybe the classified version of the strategy might have a little more about it. But there's a, it's very vague. When can we expect, or is it possible that we're going to see at some point a little more explication of what we mean and what we think of by space deterrence and how it operates for one reason, because if you want to deter somebody, it's very important for them to know what your red lines are, how your, how your thinking works, rather than say, well, we're going to deter people, but, but we're going to keep it a real big secret as to uh, what our, our key constraints are. Thanks. I'm going to let you guys decide well, let me, on that one. And Haas may want to jump in. I mean, I, I, this is, as, a, as I said, the first space strategy, and, and so not everything is in there, but I think there are a couple of important concepts in deterrence that are in there that we need to unpack some. I mean, one is you have the core concept that we just retain our right for self-defense and that we would respond to uh, a, 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 a attacks on our space systems as we would on, on any systems, and as General Cartwright indicated, might not be limited to a response in space. We choose the time and uh, fashion of our response. There are two other concepts that are in there. One is the, uh, the concept of partnership that General Cartwright was talking about, that that enhances deterrence because as you start to cross-fertilize capabilities in space, it means that attacking one, uh, attacking a constellation will not necessarily be an attack against one country, it will be atta an attack against many. And so the, you, you start to put in con the concepts of restraint that way. The, the other concept that's in there is uh, an emphasis on cross-domain capabilities, so that we don't have a single point of failure going through space, that we have alternatives in an air breathing or, or terrestrial capabilities, so there's a redundancy there. So again, you're, you're constrained from uh, uh, striking those space assets because the effect that you're looking for won't be gained and you'll get a response that you, uh, you won't be happy with. So I think though, in addition to self-defense, you have this, uh, this cross-domain uh, as well as this partnership uh, approach. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that, that in the domain itself, we've done very little development of, of deterrent strategy. Um, but there's generally two approaches. There's an in-kind uh, deterrence, which is what space-type deterrence is talking about. And then there's a broader deterrence strategy, which allows all of the mediums to be part of the coherent strategy. The idea behind deterrence uh, in, in its essence is to get in the mind of your adversary that his approach or her approach would not necessarily get them where they want to be. Change the calculus. Put doubt in their mind that they can get away with something. A couple of things that you can do in space that, that will allow you to do that is, number one, if you decide that you're going to be a bad actor in space, then you're going to be denied all of the other services of space. That's going to be uh, a, a a calculus for you because we move so much information through space today run a business if it's Walmart in China you're gonna lose your Walmart uh, so you, there's a, a price for it now uh, the other is that that what we would term combined arms is that don't put anything up there that you can't replicate someplace else so if the adversary decides you're gonna take it out there okay I got two more ways to get there you're not gonna win because you took it out there um, the third goes back to the industrial base and partnering issue 
we have moved away from ideas of scale in space. You know, we go up and do onesies and twosies in many of our constellations. We can't do that. I mean, there is this idea, first shot idea, that I'll just knock everything out in, in five or six. That's not going to happen. That, that's just physically not, not going to happen. But what you have to worry about is how long before it degrades to a point that it can't be used. And how much hardening do you want to do to put in the adversary's mind that that time may not be enough for them to act. And so we need to do more writing. We need to do more thinking about how we integrate it into the larger deterrence strategy. And I turn to you to do that. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Wheeler. Uh, Mike Wheeler, Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, the, we're working hard to, to establish a more stable strategic relationship with Russia. And we have a long history of some kinds of implicit and explicit partnering with Russia and space. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might share thoughts on how the prospects of future partnering in space with Russia might work into the larger strategy that we have of the nature of the relationship we want with them. Yeah. I'll, I'll take ahead. a crack initially. I, mean, um, I have now probably 15 years and in that 15 years of working at STRATCOM and, and in these jobs in the joint staff, um, my counterpart, uh, General Popovkin, on the Russian side, and I've had a very rich dialogue during that whole time. And we're trying to figure our way forward. One of the areas that we think there's great benefit here or great opportunity is in warning. Um, why wouldn't the whole world benefit from knowing if anything comes off the face of the earth, particularly if it's not supposed to, and where it's going? Um, why would we keep that a secret from each other? Why wouldn't that increase, increase stability, go back to the deterrence construct, make the price of trying to do something like that a lot higher? In other words, a lot of people are going to know what you did, and, and, and you're going to know attribution will be very quick. Why wouldn't we want to share that? Why wouldn't we want to co-build, co-found, co-run, co-operate um, you know, in space on situation awareness and on warning? Um, there's really no reason not to. Now the question is, can you find a model, a business model to do that? And then can you work your way through the actual exchange of the information? Everybody worries, gee, if I, if I partner with somebody, will they at, at some selected time turn their share of the system off or shut it all down? I mean, at some point you have to trust and you have to put things together. I think there's great opportunity in space to go into a cooperative activity with the Russians. Sir, Amy Butler with Aviation Week. Um, to build off the discussion about partnering, I'm curious uh, with this sort of austere fiscal, fiscal environment coming down on the Pentagon, um, you started partnering with MILSATCOM, you've done it on weather. At what point do you start getting into uh, you know, more, I guess, urgent or core considered missions such as GPS? Uh, you just mentioned warning, uh, maybe space-based missile warning, space-based missile tracking. Do you allow them? whoever they are, to buy satellites, to buy time on satellites, to contribute to development in those areas? Amy, I, you know, I'll, I'll we'll go ahead and yeah. let you all jump in, but, um, you know, we're trying to expand out. We started with COM because that was relatively ubiquitous and everybody understood, you know, that that would be a, a good way to go forward and there was a good commercial market there also, so it had great benefit. Uh, and we've done it in two or three different ways. We've done it by you can buy, technically buy one of the heads off the satellite and put it on a different satellite. You can go buy a satellite and put it in the constellation. So if it's a five ball constellation, you buy one. With one, you get the value of five. I mean, those types of approaches. Um, we've shared data and ground stations and geographic landing points for, for satellites as ways to increase the value and reduce the burden, so to speak, on any one nation. The question is, can we start to get into some of these core issues? I mean, it, GPS, Bedeau, and GLONAST are out there. The question is, can you come to a common schema? If you put the two of them together, can you find a way to move forward where you get more, more vehicles in the constellation, therefore more precise time, therefore an ability to do things in a more precise way than we can today? Things like agriculture tend to drive that, that requirement, and can you, in fact, find a way to do that? A, B, in the diversity of those signals, is that also a way to raise the deterrence strategy? In other words, okay, so you can knock one kind out, but can you knock both kinds out at the same time? Those kinds of questions change the calculus of deterrence. So there is a national security aspect that, that favors doing this kind of work. There is a commercial um, business case that favors it. 
the question here is trust. You know, and when are we going to get when are we going to get to the point of trust? And generally, when we get to the point of trust is when we can no longer afford to do it ourselves anyway. Right, so I don't know which one comes first, but you know, at some point. It's, a, it's close enough that people are willing to talk now. Well, uh, let me just add to what General Carr was saying. So I, I think you have to look at, at, at a, a, a spectrum of, of capabilities. It, it, at one end, as we said, with situational awareness, with some communications capabilities, there's already uh, a, a, a broad interest in, in sharing and collaborating on those capabilities. As you move up with the GPS, I, I think there's a, there are some core missions that we need to be able to perform, but there's some things, there's redundancy that can be provided, there's the diversity of signal, as, as General Cartwright, so you start to balance those things. And then there, there are probably some core capabilities that, that we are going to feel that we need to, need to have at, at, the, at, the very, at the very high end. But I, I think as you, you look across that spectrum, you're balancing both, you know, what are our, our national security needs, but as General Carver was saying, there, there are fiscal needs and there are clear deterrent and other advantages to collaborating. So I, I think you have to go system by system up the spectrum and make, and make that, those judgments. Yeah, my name is Jim Scheimer. I'm with um, SES World Skies, U.S. Government Solutions. Um, the question I'd like to pose is with respect to uh, space situational awareness. The, um, the two largest owner operators out there launch eight to 12 uh, communication satellites into the geo belt every year. Uh, every one of those is a candidate for an SSA sensor, uh, giving you redundancy, giving you uh, higher resolution. Uh, here to four, the logjam has been things that you've already mentioned. The government must do it. Um, how do we share standards? How do we share the data? Um, those things have, have always stood in the way of us actually <coughs> seeing a real partnership between the government and the owner operators mm -hmm. who've got these platforms going up. Uh, with the budget as it is and will be for some time, with the advent of the uh, uh, Defense Space Council, do you see any hope of breaking down that log jam in the near future so that, uh, because it, we have a commercial interest in that too, obviously. Uh, we don't like things running into our spacecraft any more than you do. Um, I mean, from well, a council standpoint, we've had for several years the forum by which we have, have worked with the uh, industrial se sector and the commercial sector. Um, that we need to keep robust. Now the question is, can we start to move towards instrumenting spacecraft, spacecraft for some proximate area around them to be aware of themselves and, and what's around them. If nothing else to say, I just got run into by debris or I just got run into by an explosive package. But, but what do we want to know about that and, and trying to work with the commercial sector to see what's appropriate to carry on the spacecraft and what's appropriate to be off board and where do the two meet because you can't afford everything. But I, I think uh, taking it up a step, I think one of the broad thrusts of this strategy is to move away from the world in which the U.S. government developed unilateral capabilities. There's still a role for that in certain instances, but we think it's much narrower. And we think not only do we need collaboration with uh, internationally, but we need collaboration commercially. Uh, and in both cases, that, that diversity provides fiscal advantages and it provides deterrent and capability advantages. So we, we're, the, the thrust of this document is exactly down the lane that you described. Colonel, you get the last question. I'm sure it's a good one, because you're never going to ask these guys a bad one. I'm going to try, sir. Thank you very much. No pressure, though. Yeah, right, no sir. pressure. <laughs> Easy one would be the one chance. <laughs> Colonel Chris Crawford, Joint Staff J3. Gentlemen, thank you for doing this. Uh, this question will be primarily uh, for Secretary Donnelly. One sentence in the uh, strategy says, human resources processes must provide the right personnel for successful execution. Since the Air Force provides the majority of our space operators and our acquisition personnel, but given that over the last 20 years we've dramatically reduced the percentage of our personnel with technical degrees and we've reduced, especially at the accession level, the broad-based space training, we typically now just focus them primarily on operating a particular system, do we re-attack at the Air Force level at that accession level to produce the human capital to really make all this go for the long term? Sir. Uh, the, the human capital issues are, are 
extremely important to the Air Force and to the rest of the community, and we, we continue to work those. Uh, the, the real driver uh, or engine uh, for uh, getting into the space business has, being, has been uh, being in the ICBM business and build it in because we have a high requirement for lieutenants and captains in the in the ICBM fields and they <laughs> feed the space business that's been the model in the past uh, we need to continue to tweak that going forward we're not getting all that we need out of that model uh, and in particular uh, right now we're we're focused on building up the uh, the the business expertise uh, at uh, Space and Missile Center out at, uh, at uh, Los Angeles uh, to help us work through uh, some of the programmatic trade-offs, uh, work through some of the tough negotiations that we have going forward uh, with, with uh, our industrial partners to get the right business models uh, that will help sustain these uh, architectures and, and build additional capability going forward. So we need we need not just uh, space operators, but we need uh, some stronger business heads in, in that mix as well. But uh, take the point that the human capital piece is extremely important. Thank you, sir. That's a great question. Okay, colleagues, uh, these guys unfortunately have other work to do today. Um, I'm going to go to lunch. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, so, uh, so let them get out the door, but please, before they leave, thank them with your applause. This has been a great question.